Hi. After all the fun we've been having with looking at the temperature of all these LEDs and PCBs, I asked Banggood if they wanted to send me any thermal cameras out of their range, and this is what they've come up with. So they've sent me through the HTI HT02, and I thought we'd have a look at this today. So this is currently retailing for around $200. There are some 15% discount codes floating around, so you can probably get it for around 170 or so. But it's this handheld unit, it's got an LCD on the back, and on the front side it's got a thermal camera and then a visible camera and it's also got an LED for a bit of illumination as well. The thermal camera is relatively low resolution, so 60 by 60 pixels, and it has a thermal sensitivity of 0 0.15 degrees C. Now it says the image frequency is 8 hertz, but I think it's a little bit slower than that. We'll have a look at that in a moment. You can save images to an SD card, and then it takes four AA batteries for power. For around $100 more, we could get hold of a Fleur 1, uh, currently at generation 3. Obviously, this offsets quite a lot of the cost of the components inside the thermal camera because they're offloading all of the processing and display and everything to your mobile phone, and therefore you're sort of getting better value for money if you're happy using your phone as part of whatever you're doing. However, according to the specifications on the Flow website, the thermal performance isn't that much different. We've got a frame rate here of 8.7 Hz. This number is probably a lot more believable than the one on the HT02, but the thermal resolution also isn't that much higher. So we've got an extra 20 rows of pixels. It's an 80 by 60 sensor rather than the 60 by 60 in the HT02. But these are pretty low spec devices at this price point. You do need to spend quite a lot more uh, to get much higher resolution there. So out of the box it comes in this carry case which is reasonably well designed, it feels quite robust and should protect it. We've got the instruction book and then we've got the camera itself and it does actually feel fairly high quality, it's not quite as cheap and chintzy as you might expect. At the front here we've got the battery cover, so we've got our four AA batteries at the front which is quite nice so we don't have to worry about charging it all the time, we can just swap out batteries if the battery is going flat. It doesn't support any means for charging, so even if you put rechargeable cells in there, uh, you wouldn't be able to charge them through a USB port or anything. At the top, we've got the SD card slot. Uh, that takes a micro SD card. Then on the front side, we've obviously got the thermal camera, the visible camera, and an LED as well. And then we've got the LCD at the back with a few buttons. Operation is fairly straightforward, so you hold down the button on the left to turn it on. It takes about five seconds to boot up. And then the image starts to come out on the LCD. So you can see the refresh rate there. It's probably about four or five hertz. I don't think it's quite all the way up to eight hertz, but it's not too bad. With the left and right buttons, we can mix in some of the visible camera. So that's purely visible. Then we're starting to add in some of the thermal image. I think that's about 50-50. And then 25%. And then fully thermal camera. Now you can see that it's not hugely well aligned at these kind of distances. I found it needs about 400 millimeters before the thermal and the visible camera images are aligned. Obviously that's because there is some offset between these two. And they probably assumed that generally speaking you're going to be using this looking at an object rather than something quite as fine pitched as your electronics. So this does tend to be a problem with a lot of these thermal cameras. It would be nice if they could come up with a way where these are adjustable uh, easily by the end user. But it's fairly well aligned and you can pretty much work out what it's talking about when you're pointing it at something like this. Now we have some options that you'd normally expect from these devices. So if we go through to the menu, you can go through and you can pick the color palette, so depending on what you want, you can go through here and if I can remember the button presses, you can choose a grayscale, you can choose that kind of rainbow, one with other colors in there, and then back to the one that you would normally expect. Um, you've got a number here which is just telling you how much storage there is on the SD card that's installed. Then we've got the emissivity, so obviously you can change that depending on what it is that you're looking at. Most people will end up just leaving it at 0 0.95 just to get an idea of what's going on. 
uh, and then we just got the current temperature of the device. You can set the time and date and some of those things. That's so that when you take a screenshot, it can save it to the SD card along with that data. We've also got the display brightness there, so we can increase this so it's a bit more visible in bright daylight. That's really quite bright, actually, so pretty clear. I'll leave it on 100%. I'm not too worried about the battery. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's fairly straightforward in its operation. It just kind of does what you would expect. There's a trigger button on this side, so when you hold it at something and then press the trigger, it asks you whether you want to save it or whether you don't want to save it. You just press the green button if you want to save it to the SD card. So what I'll do is I might just take a few shots of a few things in the lab and then we can have a look at what they actually look like taken directly from the SD card. So these are the images of the SD card. It saves them in bitmap format and we're looking at the LED clock and this temperature at the top here is referring to the centre point in the camera. So this centre point here is 31.4 degrees C. The minimum and maximum are displayed at the bottom here, so 26 in all of the darkest areas and the highest temperature in this image is 46.5 degrees C which is correlating to these transistors at the top here. You can actually turn on extra markers so that it automatically marks up on the image where those minimum and maximum points are. Here we've got a closer shot of the transistors so a little bit blurry but again you can see pretty much what's going on. I think it's only if you had a situation where you had lots of components that were very small and only one was causing you a problem, you probably wouldn't be able to identify it with this device. Another look at the camera with a little bit more of the visible camera showing, so you can see the actual image a little bit more clearly, but you can see again the offset error between the thermal camera and the visible camera. This is a shot of my hot water cylinder, and now this is pretty much aligned as you'd expect, so about 500 millimeters away we're getting really quite good alignment you can see all the parts that are getting warm so um, yeah that's pretty much working as expected we've got a shot of our LED board so we've got our heat sink getting hot here peak temperature of 42 degrees C and I added in a fan at the top here which you can probably just about make out and that actually cools the whole thing down quite a lot without much airflow on those LEDs we're getting down to 30 degrees C and not very warm at all whatsoever on the top side of the PCB. Standby power consumption of this is incredibly low so we're looking at about 30 nanoamps so given that's got a real-time clock running on there that's really quite impressive. Let's turn it on and during boot up it's about 137 milliamps and drops down to about 125 milliamps with the display at full brightness. If we actually save an image to the SD card, briefly the current's a little bit higher, about 150 milliamps, then drops back down to 125 milliamps. So that's power consumption is really not too bad at all. That means a set of these batteries should last really quite a long time, and the fact that the standby power consumption is so low You've got no trouble leaving this with batteries in for a while, assuming that you trust that the batteries aren't going to leak, but certainly it's not going to drain them flat. So I do quite like this device. It's definitely a budget device, so obviously it would be really nice if we had more resolution on the thermal camera side of things so we could make things out a little bit clearer. But for general troubleshooting, I certainly think this is going to be a big help in the lab. And I also do like the form factor. I'm much more of a fan of something like this that you can just take out, put batteries in, and then use it rather than one of the devices that I need to plug into my smartphone because you don't know five years down the line when some new versions of Android or iOS are out whether it's going to support those devices anymore, whether they're going to go obsolete. Assuming the electronics in this is designed so that it lasts long enough, in 10 years' time we can still put some AA batteries in this and it should still work. So I don't think there's much else to say about this device at the moment. You'll obviously see it in some upcoming videos because these kind of things are really useful when you're powering up your PCB and you want to see what's going on. You can just hold this over the board, have a look at what's going on without burning your fingers, which is something that I've done in the past. Done the old touch test and then ended up with a TO220 package burnt into the tip of my finger. So uh, this should be quite fun. I'll put a link to the product in the description down below. Hopefully you found the video useful and until next time, thanks for watching.